on this edition of the Left Bench TV. We'll have a recap of Maryland men's basketball's time at the Big Ten tournament in Indianapolis and an analysis of who could be filling that open head coaching slot. A preview of what lies ahead for the women's team in the big dance, how the two undefeated Maryland lacrosse teams have been dominating the field, and a sit down in the studio with the newly ranked Jim Terps. And as always, the latest with all of your favorite Maryland squads and much more. The Left Bench TV starts now. Hello and welcome back to the Left Bench TV, your sideline source for all things Maryland sports. I'm Ricky Podgorski. And I'm Kara Bruno. Big Ten tournaments, two undefeated lacrosse teams, and a weekend of nail-biting baseball. There's been a lot going on with your turfs, and we're here to catch you up on all of it. And we're going to start with the Maryland men's basketball team, which ended its season with a crushing defeat in Indianapolis on Thursday. Interim head coach Danny Manning and his team entered the Big Ten tournament as the 10 seed, which pitted them against Michigan State for the second time in five days. And just like last Sunday, the Terps struggled to close the second half gap. Eric Ayala and Fats Russell were hot to start out, combining for four threes and 21 points in their first half. But Max Christie and the Spartans were simply better. The freshman led Michigan State with 10 points on three triples early on, helping them to a nine-point halftime lead. The Spartans led by 20 at the 13-minute mark of the second half, but costly turnovers helped Maryland creep back in. Now the final minute, when Russell willed the Terps back within three with this and one layup. But on the ensuing Michigan State possession, Maryland took off its press and Tyson Walker made them pay with a turnaround jumper. The Terps kept battling though, with a back-to-back -back second chance layups from Hakeem Hart and Ayala to cut the deficit to just two. Then on the inbound, Michigan State loses it, giving Russell the chance to put Maryland ahead with this step back three, but it was just off the mark. The Spartans breathed a big sigh of relief and Christie iced the game on the other end, sending Maryland home from Indy and for the season. Maryland finished the season with a 15 and 17 record, making it its worst season winning percentage since 1993. Manning finished his interim stint at 10 and 14, and he, Ayala, and Russell reflected on the season after the Terps loss. Um, a unique and challenging year to say the least, and these guys brought it every day, competed, and um, you know they left it all on the floor. So as a staff, we're, we're all appreciative of those efforts. And, um, you know, today we ran into a, a very tough team in Michigan State that made more plays than us down the stretch. Just, I mean, there's a lot of stuff off the court that I learned. Uh, I feel like, you know, my, my time here at Maryland, you know, I developed into a man. And, um, you know, the things that I've learned from guys, you know, our managers, our walk-ons, um, you know, the, the support staff that we have, and um, everybody that's come into the program, um, I've learned so much. And, uh, you know, I'm proud to say I, I'm going I'm, to I'm be a future alum from the University of Maryland. Um, yeah, I, I love Maryland. You know, I've only been here for, you know, this year. But, you know, the relationships that I gained, um, you know, the people that I met, um, the Coach Manning and the rest of the coaching staff and, you know, my teammates, you know, um, I, I don't even know how to put it in words. Like, they mean a lot to me in that short period of time. Um, you know, I'm going to always come back to Maryland. Um, check out the guys and, you know, just see how the program's doing. Um, you know, yeah, it's just, it's a part of me now. Well, this, well, Kira, this season was shaky from the start. I mean, with the departure of Turgeon early on in the season, it left a very weird taste in the mouth of the Terrapins and kind of set the tone for the rest of the season. Right, and Danny Manning coming in all happened so fast, just like you said, with the departure. And he tried to keep it as consistent, I think, as he could. It was a rough season, but I'm excited to see what they do next season, too. Exactly. And unless you've been living under a rock, you know that Maryland and Athletic Director Damon Evans are on the hunt for their next head basketball coach. TLB's Jonas Evans joins us in the studio to break down a couple of potential candidates for the opening. Jonas? Thanks, guys. Ever since Mark Turgeon stepped down in early December, many coaches from around the country have been rumored to replace him. Maryland is considered one of the premier coaching jobs in the country, making this a huge decision for Damon Evans, perhaps his most important since he took over as athletic director in 2018. In the last few weeks, USC's Andy Enfield and Iona's Rick Pitino fell out of the race as both committed to their respective schools for the immediate future. Enfield and Patino were heavy favorites for the position, and with no clear frontrunner, plenty of coaches have a shot at the job. A heavy favorite is Providence's Ed Cooley. While Cooley would be coming from a less competitive conference in the Big East, his team, unlike Maryland, is in the NCAA tournament as a four seed, and Providence was ranked as high as number eight in the AP poll this season. 
Over his 10 years at Providence, Cooley has taken the program to the NCAA tournament six times. He won the Big East tournament in 2014 and the regular season title this year. Cooley also won Big East Coach of the Year this season. Another possible candidate is also from the Big East, and that's Kevin Willard, head coach of the Seton Hall Pirates. Willard has been coaching Division I basketball for 20 years, previously at Louisville and Iona, before heading to Seton Hall, where he's been since 2011. In his 10 years coaching the Pirates, Willard's resume is very similar to Cooley's. He's gotten his program to March Madness five times and won the Big East regular season title in 2020. Since he took over in New Jersey, Willard has recruited an All-American in Miles Powell, along with four players that have made first team All-Big East, and he's gotten three of his players to the NBA. Finally, there's Notre Dame's Mike Bray. Since he began coaching the Irish in 2000, Notre Dame has been to the tournament 13 times, including two Elite Eight appearances. In his 22 years with the program, Bray was named Big East Coach of the Year three times, back when Notre Dame was still in the conference. Most notably, Bray was named National Head Coach of the Year in 2011. And don't forget, Bray is a Maryland native. He was born in Bethesda and graduated from DeMatha Catholic High School, less than two miles from campus. Even though Bray has been in South Bend for over 20 years, if he came to College Park, some may call it a homecoming. And guys, something to note, all three of the coaches I just named here, they're going to the tournament this year, something Maryland obviously was unable to achieve. Yeah, and there's definitely some shoes to fill here in Maryland with the finding a new coach, and it'll be very exciting to see it all unfold, and I think it will definitely keep fans on their toes. All of those coaches that you mentioned, Jonas, are all great coaches and could be great fits for the Terps. Thank you so much for joining us, Jonas. Now, to everyone's surprise, the men's team wasn't the only Maryland basketball squad to go one and done in the Big Ten tournament this year. That's right, Ricky. Brenda Fries and her team are in an unfamiliar position heading into the Big Dance this year. Since joining the Big Ten, Maryland women's basketball had appeared in every Big Ten tournament championship game. But that streak was broken this year as the fourth-seeded Terps were ousted by fifth-seeded Indiana in the quarterfinals. Katie Benson is one of the best shooters in the country, but the guard didn't have a shot fall once. Ashley Owusu, who's been battling an ankle injury, came off the bench and carried the team on her back with 21 points. But Chloe Bibby, Cheyenne Sellers, and Diamond Miller only had four points apiece. Power Forward of the Year finalist Angel Reese notched 14 points for the Terps, but the offensive collapse and inability to hit a single three-pointer proved lethal for their hopes of another conference tournament title. Indiana took this one 62-51 and eventually made it to the championship game, where Iowa took the trophy home. But that isn't the end of the road for the Terps, because they're going dancing. The team hosted an NCAA selection show watch party Sunday night at Xfinity Center. The excitement was high last night as the Maryland women's basketball team learned their fate for the first round of March Madness, and it was much to their approval. I mean, we have the best fans in the country, you know, to be able to come in, and, you know, this has been taken away from us the last couple of years, so I know our fans will rally behind it. Knowing March, anything can happen, so I was just surprised and happy and excited all at the same time. <laughs> and if you wanted to watch this team in person make an impact in the big dance, you're in luck because the fourth seeded Terps will host 13 seeded Delaware for the first round of the tournament right here in College Park. TLB's Kevin McNulty will have the coverage of Maryland's first step in what could be a deep run to the Final Four in Minneapolis. Should the Terps advance to the second round, they'll host the winner of the Virginia Tech and FGCU matchup on Sunday. Now, Ricky, this women's basketball team is always a pleasure to watch, and this tournament will be very exciting to see how they do. And I really think that the X factor of this year's tournament will be Angel Reese. She has played so well all season, and I really think she will have a dominant performance in the tournament this year. Two gymnastics now, and the gym Terps are on quite the roll lately. After recording its second-best score in program history at the Towson Tri-Meet on Thursday, the Terps hosted George Washington, Penn, and Bridgeport in their home finale and senior day on Sunday. The Terps have been strong on vault all season, and that remained the same, as seniors Alexis Rubio tied her career high with a 9.9. .9. On to bars, where junior Emma Silverman tied the program record, notching a near flawless 9.95. And she stayed hot on the day, leading the beam team alongside all-time program leader Audrey Barber, both sealing a 9.875. And speaking of Barber, she shined on her senior day, securing a 9.95 on the floor and taking the crown with a 39.575 in her final regular season all around. Maryland was victorious, totaling 197.025 points, its fifth highest score in program history. Maryland ends the regular season with a 17-7 record, winning four meets in a row and scoring above a 197 for three consecutive meets to close it out. And that was exactly what the Jim Terps needed to move into the top 25. 
They're now ranked 20th in the nation heading into the postseason. They're also 17th on the vault, 13th on the bars, and Audrey Barber is 11th in the all-around nationally. They'll travel to Columbus to compete in the Big Ten Championships this Saturday. We're now so excited to be joined by two of those 20th ranked gym terps, junior Emma Silverman and senior Sonia Glauber. Thank you guys so much for joining us. It's been a crazy couple of weeks for you, so I hope you're ready to break it all down with us. So guys, we just recapped Sunday's meet, but we want to hear about it from you too. Sonia, it was your senior day. Uh, what emotions were going through your head throughout the day, and what was it like to go on such a regular, like, to end that regular season on such a high note? Yeah, it was crazy. I think um, ending off like we did last weekend, and we were all super hyped and ready to go into senior night and attack it like no other. Um, us seniors were definitely very sentimental um, and wanted to do as best we could and end with a bang. So I think that was all our goals, and we definitely achieved that for sure. So we're super proud with what happened on Sunday. <coughs> And Emma, as a junior, it wasn't your senior day, but you got a 9.95 on the bars, tying the program record. And this has been your comeback season, recovering from last year's ACL injury. So what, did, what was that moment on Sunday like for you, and what has this comeback season meant to you? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I have no words. Like, just like Brett said, I'm speechless. I have no idea. Like, I didn't know it was coming, but I have the confidence in me and my team and in this comeback and everyone that's helped us throughout this journey. So just feel surreal. Now, we had Coach Nelligan on the show two weeks ago, and he said he had a great time. So shout out to Coach again for coming on. Um, but when he was here, uh, he was talking about how excited he was to get some people back from injury because he knew you guys were nowhere near your peak yet. Um, and that aged pretty well because ever since, you guys have been stellar. Um, scoring about a 197 from, for three straight meets. Um, what does it mean to your team to be able to end a regular season like this on such a high capacity? Yeah. I mean, I think it's been, again, it's been a huge accomplishment. We haven't gone, either of us, 197 since we've been here. Um, I think since 2004 was the last time the team went 197. So um, it was a huge, huge accomplishment for all of us. But like Brett was saying, um, this team definitely, we've known from the beginning that we've had huge potential. Um, and we were just waiting for that uphill climb. And it's, I mean, we're still not done. So, um, yeah, it's been super exciting. Yeah, and I mean... 197 is just a benchmark, like we're still shooting for the stars. And um, just knowing that we have three in a row, it just boosts our confidence because it wasn't just a one-time thing, like this is us. And since the regular season is all wrapped up and it's all postseason now, starting this Saturday in Columbus with the Big Ten Championships, what are you both most looking forward to from here on out? Yeah, I mean, I think from here on out, going into postseason, it's super exciting. Postseason is the most fun part, um, in my opinion, of the season. It's something that we all look forward to um, from the first meet of the year. So especially Big Tens, the energy and the atmosphere is crazy. Um, and having fans back in the arena has been huge. Our parents have been huge supporters this year and have cheered super loud. So it's we're very excited to get back in there. And um, especially with what we've just been doing the past three weeks, we definitely feel super confident and uh, just as much of a contender in the Big Ten this year as any other. I mean, all the teams in the Big Ten for gymnastics have been showing out this year, so, and we're definitely right up there with them, so we're super excited. Yeah, and this is my first year in postseason just because my freshman year, everything being shut down with COVID, and last year, my injuries, so I'm just so excited. And I don't think we're going to treat it just like uh, differently than any other meet. We're just going to go in with the same confidence, so I'm hoping for just similar results that we've been getting. Well, before we let you guys go, um, since you both are out of state, we have a few quick questions, fun questions for you guys regarding Maryland. Does that sound okay? Yeah, <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> All right, first one, yay or nay to Old Bay seasoning? Definitely yay. I like Old Bay, but <laughs> Sonia tried to put it on steak the other day, so I don't know. <laughs> it was, I, I think I put too much on, and that was where I went wrong, but I definitely like Old Bay. I tried to get my parents into it, and they had no idea what it was because I'm from California, so um I'm, I'm hoping to get them on the bandwagon as well, but we'll see. <laughs> I'm from Connecticut, so I'm definitely bringing some Old Bay up yeah. to the New England area <laughs> yes. when I go back home. Um, so next up, Marylanders are very, very known for loving their state flag. Um, what do you guys think? Is the state flag overrated, underrated, properly rated? I love it. Yeah? I love it too. Yeah. I think coming to UMD, it makes you <laughs> love it even more, honestly. Um, and you realize how, how much of a prominent like statement it is, especially in the athletic department. It's everywhere. It's on everything we wear. It's on everything that we bring to meets and competitions. And it's literally everywhere. So I definitely don't think it's overhyped. Yeah, I love it too. I mean, we went to Towson the other day and they had the Maryland State flag up and it was like we never even left. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I would say the same thing. I, yeah. I love the flag as well. Mm -hmm. So the last one for today, what is the coolest thing that you guys have experienced as a turf these past few years? That's a hard one. That's so hard. <laughs> There's been a lot of um, a lot of surreal moments, like Emma was saying. I mean, and a lot of ups and downs too, given 2020 um, and going into this year. But I think for me, um, in terms of gymnastics, definitely also tying the program record right there with Emma last year um, was a huge accomplishment for me um, and just an amazing feeling. I mean, hitting that floor and sticking your landing on bars and watching your team go crazy, there's no other feeling like it literally in the world. I don't think I will ever be able to match that kind of energy or um, have that same type of like pride in myself and for the school. So yeah, that's probably my number one. Um, I feel like Every day, I just love being a Terp every day, more and more. <laughs> but um, if I had to pick one, oh, gymnastics related, just every day I walk into that gym, I just love the team, I love the coaches, I love the support staff. Each day is different and we're thrown with new things and it's just, just so fun to overcome them together and as a family. So I don't know, I can't even pick one. <laughs> Well, thank you guys for those fun questions. And while we're talking gymnastics, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention another major milestone recently coming out of the program. Senior Ard Audrey Barber made history for the Gym Terps just over a week ago, becoming the program's all-time leading scorer. Our executive producer, Katie Marr, spoke with Audrey and Coach Nelligan about her accomplishment and looked back on her five-year journey as a Terp. Audrey Barber has become the highest scoring gymnast in Maryland gymnastics history. That's the sound of Xfinity Center going crazy for history made. On Sunday, March 6th, Audrey Barber stamped her name in the record books, becoming Maryland Gymnastics' all-time leading scorer with this 9.9 .9 on the vault. Barber, a fifth-year Maryland native, has said competing in the all-around was something she knew she wanted from her collegiate career and has performed in all four events in every meet she's ever competed in as a Terp. Her stellar scores have proved essential to plenty of team wins for the past five years. It's been an incredible journey and I'm just so thankful that I've been a part of it and, and got to watch her grow as a gymnast, as a teammate. Um, she, I've said this before, but her, you know, her DNA is winning, right? She just knows how to win, and when the moment is the, the brightest, when the lights are on, that's when she's at her best. Uh, she's made me a better coach. She's made our program better, and I, I know all the sacrifices she's made along the way. It, it's hard, day in and day out in the gym, and her putting in the work, putting in the numbers. And speaking of those numbers, she's now standing on top with a total of 2,076.15 on her career, which is by no means over yet. Barbara is looking forward to closing things out with her team on the highest note possible. I didn't expect it to be this great. I thought things would just, you know, go a little like, you know, smoothly, and then I would graduate and that would be that. But like this year has been an absolute blast. The team is amazing, and we're capable of like so many amazing things, and I'm so proud of everybody. For the Left Bench TV, I'm Katie Marr. Well, Kira, Audrey certainly has left her legacy as a all-time Jim Terp, but also as one of the Maryland Athletics all-time athletes. Yeah, definitely. I'm super excited to see what she ends up doing in this postseason. When we come back, I'll be over at the Monitor doing every college basketball fan's favorite March activity, some bracketology. And we'll be joined by TLB beat writer Logan Hill to talk all things Maryland men's lacrosse, and of course highlight the dominant win from the women's team on Sunday. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Left Bench TV, and welcome to the madness. I'm now joined by TLB executive producer Kevin McNulty to talk about this year's NCAA tournament and some of the teams from the Big Ten looking to make some noise. Yeah, that's right, Ricky. Obviously, Maryland not in the tournament for the first time since 2018, but let's take a look at the path for some of the teams from around the conference that Maryland competed against all year. All right, well, let's start with that Western region and see what we got here. Yeah, well, I mean, Gonzaga is the number one seed again in this region, number one overall. I'd be shocked if they didn't go back to the Final Four. But you're looking at the two seed down here in Duke, Coach K's final season. We know all about that. And look at this, team from the Big Ten that Maryland lost to twice last week in the regular season finale and then in the Big Ten tournament in Michigan State. We might end up 
with a classic Coach K, Tom Izzo matchup in the round of 32. How do you think that'll go, Ricky? You know, I really like Duke this year, but if you look a little further down the bracket, Duke would have a very tough time getting out of this West region. They would have to fight Michigan State, then a very good Texas Tech team, and possibly Gonzaga. Duke's matchup looks a little tough coming out of that, that West region. Now, moving on to the South, we have three Big Ten teams here. We got number four, Illinois, number seven, Ohio State, number 11, Michigan. Now, Kevin, what teams should be on the upset watch or upset bubble? Well, I think if you see a Big Ten team upset in the first round, it's going to be in this region. Illinois has been really solid all year. They have a monster in Kofi Coburn down low, first team all Big Ten. But you look at their matchup against Chattanooga in the first round, and they could easily get knocked off. Illinois got bounced in their first game in the Big Ten tournament, and, well, who knows, it could happen again to them. They were bouncing around to 32 last season, and Chattanooga is a really solid team. I do want to note uh, the 13 seeds are 5 and 7 over the past three years against the fours, so I think one of those four seeds is going to go down in the first round could be Illinois. And then you look down at the 7-10 line at Ohio State against Loyola Chicago. Loyola Chicago is made deep runs in the past, went to the Final Four a couple of years ago, their first year under Drew Valentine. They've been awesome. That's a popular pick. I think at ESPN right now, it's about 60-40 Loyola over Ohio State. That could easily happen. And then you look at Michigan. On the 11 line, people don't think they should have been one of the last four buys, but they are, and they're favored in that game against Colorado State out of the Mountain West. I would not be shocked if Michigan moves on to play Tennessee in the round of 32, and Tennessee looks really good. A lot of people also thought they should have been a two-seat. The one team that stands out to me is Loyola Chicago for sure. They bounced Illinois out in second round last year. It would be diff definitely something interesting to see if they bounce Ohio State out in the first. Now moving on to the Midwest region, a packed region. We have the Big Ten tourney champs at number five, Iowa, and we have the Big Ten regular season champs, number three, Wisconsin. How far can you see these teams going, and could they really make a serious championship run? Well, just like I think the South is a region where you might see a Big Ten team get upset, this region in the Midwest is maybe where you see a Big Ten team move on to the Final Four. Iowa has a really good chance. Both of these teams from the Big Ten are built the same way. Iowa has their star in Keegan Murray. And then they have their veteran in Jordan Bohannon, who made that buzzer beater in the Big Ten tournament semifinal the other day. He's just been outstanding. This Iowa team probably deserves higher than a five seed. I thought they were a five seed before the Big Ten tournament. And then they went and won the whole thing. Wisconsin, three seed. They're kind of backing in to the NCAA tournament. Fell to Nebraska and couldn't claim the Big Ten title outright last Sunday. And then they got bounced by Michigan State in the Big Ten tournament. But this Wisconsin team is really good. Another veteran, Brad Davison. And then they have their star in Johnny Davis. So you look at Wisconsin's path. They would have to get through Auburn if it turns into chalk in the Sweet 16. I have Auburn going to the Final Four. They have one of the best four men in the game in Jabari Smith. So I think Auburn moves on from this region. But, I mean, Iowa, if they make it to the Sweet 16 and take on Kansas, Kansas is a really solid team. Obviously, they're one seed for a reason. But I don't see why Iowa and Keegan Murray can't knock them off. Like you said with Auburn, Jabari Smith is an NBA caliber player. And like NBA caliber players, you have Jaden Ivey of Purdue moving on to that East region. Um, number three, Purdue, and number 12, Indiana in that first four matchup. What do you think about Indiana? Do you think they have a high ceiling if they get out of that first four matchup? Well, just like I didn't really think that Michigan should have been one of the last four buys, I don't think Indiana should have been playing in the first four. They're going to be in Dayton, and there are going to be a lot of Indiana fans there. I think they move on and take down St. Mary's. St. Mary's is a really good ball club. They beat Gonzaga once this year, but Indiana has all the makings of a really good NCAA tournament team. And I don't see why they can't get it done with guys like Trace Jackson Davis, as you see on your screen there. The other team from the Big Ten in this region is Purdue. Now, you may remember when Maryland went to Mackey Arena and almost took down the Boilermakers, but I think this Purdue team is the most talented team in the Big Ten with Jaden Ivey, a huge NBA draft prospect. They would have to go through Kentucky if they were to meet with the Wildcats in the Sweet 16. That's no easy task with Oscar Shibe has been playing outstanding for the Wildcats all season long. It's a very interesting region. I do have Purdue coming out of this one to take on Gonzaga in um, New Orleans, come to the Final Four, but who knows what can happen here. Purdue, again, most talented team in the Big Ten. 
I agree, definitely. And I really like this Kentucky team coming out of this East region. I actually have Kentucky winning this year's tournament, and I really think that Purdue-Kentucky matchup would be something awesome to see in this bracket. Who do you have winning this year's tournament, Kevin? Well, I think it's finally the year of the Zags. They went to the national title game last season, and while they came up short against the number one seed in this region in Baylor, I think it's finally time that Drew Timmy and Mark Few get it done in New Orleans. They're cutting down the nets. I think it's their time. But Big Ten has a huge statement to make. They have the most teams in. That Nine of the 14 teams are in the tournament. So I'm really rooting for the Big Ten, even though Maryland is not in the field this year. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin, for coming on and talking about this bracket. I hope you guys have a little more insight. Now, Kira, now back to Kira to talk about men's lacks. Thanks, Ricky and Kevin. And now over to men's lacrosse, who held a historic senior day game this past Saturday inside Jonas Hill House. The first game held on the site that was Cole Field House since 2002. The Terps absolutely dominated the University of Albany, defeating the Great Danes 24-6 to and scoring the most goals in a single game since 1995. After celebrating its eight graduating seniors, Maryland Lacrosse got to work on offense, knocking in 11 goals in the first quarter alone. Jonathan Donville had a hat trick before the first, first quarter was even over, and 13 different players contributed to the win. Sophomore Daniel Kelly led the Terps with four goals, which were the first collegiate goals of his career. Maryland is now gearing up for the anticipated NCAA championship rematch between the Terps and Virginia, which will be playing this Saturday at Audi Field. After the game, John Tillman offered his thoughts on the historic matchup. We benefited from a couple early violations um, at the faceoff X, which got us some you know, extra mans and, and a bunch of possessions. Uh, but I thought our guys did a really good job. They played very maturely, shared the ball, we moved it. Uh, I thought we shot incredibly well, put the ball in really good spots um, against a good goalie, um, which created some momentum. And we are now thrilled to welcome in our men's lacrosse beat writer, Logan, to break down the hard shells first six games and preview their highly anticipated championship rematch this Saturday. Logan, before we start talking about that game, we want to know, what stood out to you, what's the biggest difference to you between last year's running, running up squad to this year's 6-0 team? Hmm, that's, a, that's a good place to start, and thanks for having me on. Uh, this year, well, let's start with last year, is Jared Bernhardt was the show last year. He did it all for a very talented Maryland team. I mean, they went undefeated until that final championship game. He was the star. That's who you game plan for. This, this year, this time around, you never know whose day it's going to be offensively. They have talent all over the ball, and they've showed that through these first six games of the year. And like you said with the loss of Jared Bernhardt, what has the transfer portal done for this team with the addition of guys like Keegan Kahn and, and um, Jonathan Donville? And it's, it's done a lot, I mean, to put it shortly there. Uh, Donville has been on a tear in that midfield, and then Keegan Kahn filling right in into the attacking unit. And... Instead of relying on underclassmen to come up and kind of fill that void, Tillman went straight to the transfer portal and got a, a couple of great players, and they've really clicked together as a unit, and that's why they've gotten off to such a hot start. All right, now let's go back to this matchup this Saturday in Washington, D.C. It's number one Maryland versus number two Virginia, a rematch of last year's national title where the Cavaliers defeated the Terps and got the trophy. So what does Maryland need to do to confidently assert itself as the best team in the nation right now? I think it's simple. I mean, I think you just do what you've been doing to this point. Don't, it's a big game, don't get me wrong. I'm, and that's what Maryland's probably been thinking about since the season started. But you got to 6-0 and one way. Don't change that, don't stray from that. Because in that championship game, it was a one goal game. It's not like Virginia just came in and blew them out of the water. And I think if you play that game nine times out of 10, it could go a different way. So. It's going to be a big game. It's going to be a great atmosphere. It's at Audi Field. But just don't go away from what's worked to this point. That's all the time we have with you today, Logan. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, be sure to keep up with Logan on all of his coverage on Twitter and at theleftbench.com. Maryland women's lacrosse followed suit with the men's team, moving its game against Villanova to Sunday in the Jones Hill House due to inclement weather in College Park. Even on a different field, it was business as usual for the Terps, who were getting everything they wanted offensively. Grad transfer more accordingly led the team with six goals and five assists, followed by fellow grad student Grace Griffin, who had four. Maryland totaled 19 goals on the day, only one shy of their season best. The Terps even managed to score five goals in less than five minutes. They were seriously on fire. And don't forget about the defense Kathy Reese's squad held Villanova to only seven goals. 
the team's second lowest total on the season. We had a few goals off of fast breaks, and I think you know a lot of that is created by either our defense stepping up and anticipating and coming out with interceptions, or our offense causing you know turnovers in, in, the, in the ride. On Friday night, Maryland baseball took down Georgetown in thrilling walk-off fashion, thanks to Matt Shaw. And on Sunday, the Dirty Terps dominated Cornell at the Bob. Ryan Ramsey was a force to be reckoned with on Sunday afternoon, allowing only one hit over six innings of work. He collected a career-high 13 strikeouts in his start. A, on the offensive side of things, Maxwell Costas hit a two-run blast over the center field wall to give the Terps an early lead. And Maryland put up an eight spot in the bottom of the fourth, which included RBI hits from Costas, Bobby Zamarlak, and Jacob Orr. Maryland would go on to beat Cornell 12 to 5. Tuesday at 3 p.m., the Terps face a rematch with Delaware. And you remember the last time these two teams met. Maryland won by 10 runs, so the Terps will definitely be looking to dominate the Blue Hens once again. Well, Maryland softball isn't off to as an exciting start as the baseball team, but the good news is they have plenty of time to turn things around. The Terps currently stand at 10 and 11 on the season, and they just snagged a 12 to 5 win against James Madison on Friday. Despite their team losing five games in a row, sophomore Michaela Jones is on fire right now. She's leading the team in batting average and hits, and is tied for the most RBIs on the team. The Terps will host the Maryland Invitational this weekend, its first series at home this season. They'll kick things off on Wednesday at 6 p.m. against UMBC, looking to move back to 500 on the year. TLB's Maggie McGuigan will have that coverage. We've still got lots more in store for you when you come back, including a look behind the scenes of what goes into marketing a major Maryland basketball game. And of course, your top five plays, Terp of the Week, and Pro Terp. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back once again to the Left Bench TV from November to March. Fans packed the Xfinity Center to watch men's basketball put on a show for the Maryland community. But the magic of the fan experience at Xfinity goes further than just the stars, drilling shots on the hardwood. Our Jonas Evans took a look at what happens behind the scenes of a men's basketball game in College Park. For me, it's, it's the environment. Like, I've been to tons of different college basketball venues across the country, and um, not many, I think, can reach sort of the pinnacle um, of noise level, of crowd engagement, of all of those things that I think we can hear. This season, Maryland fans came to the Xfinity Center to watch and cheer stars like Eric Ayala and Fats Russell perform wonders on the basketball court. But behind the scenes, there are a ton of people working to make that fan experience even better. The program is built on success, right? Like we won a national championship, then moved into a brand new amazing building, um, now Xfinity Center, that I think everyone has seen it reach sort of like the pinnacle um, of what college basketball is, and, and it helps our team win games. Preparing for a key Big Ten matchup like Ohio State requires months of preparation, and the physical work starts the day before the big game. I'm wearing gym clothes because we're all putting out t-shirts on in the arena, um, and it goes significantly quicker when we have a lot of people here. So we have 17 members of our wrestling team here. We have our entire full-time staff here that aren't at men's or women's lacrosse right now. Um, and then we have our intern staff here too. So um, it really does take a village, everything that we do. All of us have the same goal in mind, right? To, to have a ton of people in our venue cheering on our teams and, and getting a win. So the ultimate goal is the same for everybody. The Ohio State game also featured Maryland's eighth flash mob, which adds another key element to the Maryland basketball experience. I think a big part of that is where we place the students. Um, there aren't a ton of schools that place the students in, in, in such prime locations. Like we give our best seats to the students. For the Left Bench TV, I'm Jonas Evans. Between two dominating lacrosse games, a high-scoring gymnastics meet, and a 20-point comeback in Indy, we had our work cut out for us picking just five plays to honor as our top five this week. But we think we've selected the best of the best, so let's get started. Starting off at number five, it's junior Hannah Lou Becker, finding the hole in Villanova's defense for a quick-fire goal. It was Lou Becker's third goal of the day and her 18th on the season. At number four, it's a quick pass from Dante Scott to Fats Russell, then to Hakeem Hart, dodging Max Christie for a big slam. A huge momentum driver right when the Terps needed it the most. Hart has certainly had his fair share of standout moments this season, and this was a great one to end with. 
Next up, it's midfielder John Geppert knocking the ball loose from a Great Dane to send it right back into the net with 14 seconds left in the first quarter, helping the Terps to an 11-0 lead over Albany. At number two, it's Emma Silverman stunning on the uneven bars, tying the program record with a 9.95. It was just about a year ago that she injured her ACL, dismounting from her bars routine in Xfinity Center. Clearly, that injury looks like history. Slibs killed this routine, just like she's been killing it for the entirety of her comeback season. And your top play of the week is courtesy of Matt Shaw. Down 9-8 to Georgetown at the bottom of the ninth with Chris Elaine on base, Shaw had the chance to send this team home with a win, and he did so in walk-off fashion. Not only securing a 10-9 victory for the Dirty Terps, but also securing his place as our top play of the week. And check out his team going crazy for the big hit. Almost as crazy as TLB Shane Connick. Congrats to Matt. Not only did we have a hard time picking our top five plays, but we had quite a lot of athletes in the running for Terp of the Week. And we realized there was one clear winner. Women's lacrosse star grad transfer Aurora Accordingly. Accordingly had a day on Sunday at Jones Hill House, racking up six goals and five assists for a career high 11 points, the most by a Terp since 2013 and just one shy of the school record set back in 2001. She's only the sixth Terp to ever have an 11th point game. Quirley is leading the country in scoring and has notched at least three goals in every game this season. Her addition to Kathy Reese's already strong roster has made this squad a scary matchup, and I think everyone's excited to see what she does in the postseason this May. Now, between Aaron Wiggins, Bruno Fernando, and other Terps in the NBA, they've been tearing it up lately. But we have to give this week's Pro Terp to Jalen Smith. Styx was at his home stadium to cheer on Maryland in the Big Ten tournament on Thursday. That was only a few days after he popped off for a double-double on the road against the Detroit Pistons. He's absolutely loving his new home in Indiana, where he's been grabbing boards and throwing down slams, which we seldom saw when he was in Phoenix. Smith continued his hot stretch against Kevin Herter and the Hawks on Sunday with another double-double. Maryland sure does miss him. An honorable mention for this week's Pro Terp would be J.C. Jackson, who just signed a five-year, $82.5 million contract with the Los Angeles Chargers. And now we're joined with the Wright brothers. We have Noah Ferguson and Logan Hill here, and we're going to play a game called Hot or Not. Ricky, want to explain? So our producers provided some paper with some hot takes, and we are going to be deciding if they are hot takes or not. So do you guys want to get started? Yes, sir. All right, so Let's the first it. take we have... Xavier Green or Julian Reese should have started over Caduceus Wahab. I don't think that this one's that hot. I mean, all season you saw the same starting five, game in and game out. There was, I think, one or two occasions where they mixed it up a little bit. And this wasn't a top ten team. This wasn't a team that was blowing people out. It was a lost season. And so why not try other lineups, see what you can get out of it? I mean, I agree with that, but I also, if you think about, you know, Xavier Green is six foot six, right? So uh, against like the the very very tall centers, it's going to be a little bit tough. And Julian Reese, we know that he, I mean, he's a great young talent, but he can pick up fouls in a hurry. So I I, I think that at least for some of the games, Kadus Wahab starting still makes sense. So I'm going to say that's a little bit of a hot take there. Yeah, I definitely agree with both of you guys. I think Kadus was great out there, but I also think I would have liked to see Reese go out there and start. I think it would have been. Really exciting to see from him. I agree with you, Kira. I think Julian Reese has more ball security and a better uh, footwork than Caduce Wahab, and I really think if he were to start earlier in the season, that would have had a greater impact and potentially set the season a little better um, off tone-wise than it did earlier on in the year. All right, we'll head to our next question. The loss to Virginia Tech wasn't as bad as people thought. This is another take that just it isn't that hot to me. I mean, at the time, it was, it was the Len Bias game. It was a big ACC Big Ten challenge. And they, Maryland lost by four to a team that just won the ACC tournament earlier last week. So it wasn't – at the time, it felt like the world was falling down around Maryland basketball. And it's clear to see now that that was just them facing a team that was very, very good. Yeah, I agree. That's a, it's not very hot of a take, grant, given that Virginia Tech just won the ACC. So, uh, I mean, yeah, as you said, uh, people, were, people were screaming and crying there, but uh, I don't think that, that it was – that's not too hot of a take there. Yeah, once again, I agree with you guys. You guys said it very well. Virginia Tech was a great team, and there was just so much going on that night for the Terps. So, not that much of a hot take for me either. Virginia Tech does have that talent, as we said, winning the ACC tournament, but – I was at that game, and I do really feel like that that was the turning point for Maryland season. I really feel like after that loss, 
um, Maryland was just kind of on a downward spiral. So I do think that that was a very important uh, loss in the trajectory of the Maryland season. All right, and we have our very last one here. Maryland makes the tournament if Turgeon doesn't depart. I think of the four that we had, this one is probably gets to the hottest because any way you look at this team, this was a team that had question marks that never really got answered at any point during the year. I like to believe that they would have somehow snuck into a tournament if Turgeon sticks around because I believe that they would have addressed their chemistry issues instead of having the, we just lost our head coach of 10 seasons, instead of having that weighing over the program the rest of the year. So I think if he sticks around, Maryland figures it out and wins some more games down the stretch than they did. Yeah, and guys, we'll never know. That's, that's, the, that's the thing. But um, I mean, given Turgeon's track record, right, 10, 10 seasons, 10 successful seasons, uh, at least in, in my opinion. And last, last season he took a team that maybe wouldn't have made the tournament to not even just the tournament, but they, but they won in, in the first round. And the year before that, when they got their season canceled, they had won the entire Big Ten, which the Big Ten – you know, it might be the best basketball conference in the country. So I would like to say that, that they would have made the tournament this year, especially with how Fats Russell played down the stretch, how Eric Ayala played. But, again, we'll never know. Right, and if you think about it, like, that was a huge shake in the team. It's your coach for 10 seasons, and it's crazy to switch and have Danny Manning coach. But, um, like you guys said, I think they had a lot to work on, and I think if Turgeon was still there, they would have won a few games more. And such an early departure from Turgeon was really just messed up the, the the whole sort of function that the Terps had. It was sort of a distraction as the season progressed. And I feel like if the departure was later on or after the season, um, it would kind of not result in as much of a distraction. So um, I agree with you guys. I really do see that. Um, I feel like they would have gotten a few more wins. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Really appreciate you guys having you guys on. Thanks for having us on. Yeah. Well, that does it for this edition of the Left Bench TV. Be sure to keep up with all of our coverage on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Left Bench. We'll see you next time.